The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, UNU Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Ask for Candy, where a bunch of powerhouse women and a few brave dudes get together online to talk about love, sex, relationships, and what it takes to be amazing on the daily. Who I am, I am Candice Harper, lovecoach.com. I teach and inspire audacious intimacy to powerful, professional, grown women who want real relationships from seductive singlehoods. More importantly, I help hardworking women who have survived abuse become vibrant, alive, magnetic, and passionate so they can easily recognize and create healthy relationships. Tonight, I am coming to you from Brooklyn. I think we're in Gowanus. Are we in, we're in Gowanus? Somewhere. Somewhere close in, to there. Somewhere yeah. close to there. We're at a place called the Ample Creamery where the ice cream is delicious. We're having ice cream. It's really good. Ask for Candy is on the road. I'm switching up the format a little bit. And um, I'm on the lookout for lifestyle experts, coaches, therapists, and people who are making a positive contribution to the world. This spring and possibly through the summer, Ask for Candy will come to you. So let me know if you want me to come to where you are so we can sit down and have an interview like we're going to have tonight with my friend David, who I'm going to introduce you to in a moment. All you need is a strong Wi-Fi connection, a place to plug in, and a problem-solving message to offer the world, and I will come interview you right here on Ask for Candy. Happy Monday, everybody. You are maybe listening to us on your TuneIn app, on your smart device, or maybe you're in the garden on armedradioglobal.com. We're also on iHeartRadio, so if you have an Alexa, you can ask for candy. And for the streamers, we're also available on Spotify and Spreaker. Now, tonight is the first night that we're doing this live from the business page. So what I want to make sure that we do, David, is share. So we want to share to my normal timeline, and I also want to share to Armed Radio Global. I know. And you guys that are out there listening, you make sure you take the time to share because everybody's used to coming to my timeline. They're not necessarily used to coming to my business page. And I want to make sure everybody can find us. Right? Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. Let me see. Okay. All right. I found it. And now I'm going to share us. Hold on a second. And by audio people. And you know what? Actually, audio people, what you guys should be doing is, you know, coming online so you can also share. Wait, here we go. Share. Share to group. We're going to share it to the Creative Love Collective. All right. So also you can call in during the course of the podcast. 1-800-508-5431. And you can also email me at askforcandypodcast at gmail.com. And those questions will be answered in a later broadcast. So like I said, I'm CandiceHarperLoveCoach.com. My talent is conversation. My passion is personal growth. And my purpose is to teach and inspire radical self-acceptance in myself and others so that we can all have our best possible love life. And that is why this is a conversation. We're not here to hand down a bunch of dating and relationship rules or rights and wrongs. We're not here to shame your love situation. Our only intention is to create audacious intimacy, seductive singlehoods, and healthy relationships. I see TJ came in. Hi, TJ. Thank you for the like. So tonight and every Monday night, we're going to do what we do, which is have conversations that engage, educate, and or enlighten all of us in the areas of love, sex, relationships, and vibrating high. And tonight's topic, right? Tonight, vibrating high. Vibrating like high, honey. <laughs> tonight's topic is toxic masculinity versus healthy masculinity. What does it all mean? And how do we know if we're experiencing it? And when should we run the hell out of there? And our special guest tonight is my friend, my brother in personal growth, who I've known for... How long have we known each other, David? It's got to be three or four years, maybe? I would, at least. Yeah. I feel like it might be, like, five. Because what is it? It's 2019. I feel like we started... I started in Landmark, what, 2013 or 14? Yeah, I think I was a 14, so... Yeah, I think we're going, on, we're going on five years, buddy. Yep. And I see Anthony just joined. What's up, Anthony? 
So yeah, I love this dude. Not only is he a world traveler, he's also got extensive experience across the financial industry with Greenwich Associates, Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of China. Honey, when are we going on a trip? Because it sounds like you got money. Whenever you want. Yeah. You ready? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> in addition to his financial background, David has years of experience in the personal and professional growth, training, and development including two years coaching a high-performance leadership program, public speaker training, and improvisational comedy. I love that. True. And I love ice cream. Do you? Me too. We got ice cream here. Ample creamery, everybody. Ample creamery. Now, did you ever do an improv group or something like that? I did. I did a number of classes and also performances. Did you? The whole thing. That's it. Brought me out of my shell a little bit. So. Did it? Yeah. Well, did you decide to do it because you had like presentations to do, things like that? Or you know, what was your ultimate goal about it? You just wanted to like... Yeah, I, t- I mean, I t- uh, initially I took a course around communication and realized I had some challenges. Uh-huh. And one of the recommendations was take an improvisational comedy class. Yeah, yeah. And so I did that. And then I kept doing it because it really it was scary as all hell. Yeah. But it also pushed me outside of my comfort zone and gave me this new comfort in terms of being out there in the world, expressing myself, and also got to experience some emotions that maybe outside my bandwidth as yeah. I was taking on different characters that I wouldn't always kind of step into in my personal life. Totally. I love it because it's very bucket list. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just one of those things because most of us have fears around like public speaking and being, and also making people laugh. Like that's, yeah, I feel like I I always admire comedians because that's a big deal. It's one of people's biggest fears is being out in the public and speaking. Right. So this really breaks through that. And it's, uh, I mean, the first class was absolutely terrifying yeah and you kind of start to like oh this isn't so bad <laughs> and it's not so bad yeah. Yeah. yeah did you feel like you were good at it after no that? <laughs> <laughs> like nobody was laughing well it was a broad mix but some of the some of the people who were be part of it were drama majors and had okay. that theater background and that and was said, well, i don't know if i fit in i don't know if i'm actually funny yeah I'm probably not yeah yeah I get <laughs> but it. a lot of it was actually being authentically engage with whatever your scene was so it wasn't necessarily being funny it was finding the funny and then learning how to come back around to it i love it so you learn the skills of it the skills of comedy that's awesome so as you can see david is a sweetheart all around good guy and one of the first people that i interviewed back when i was doing periscopes we were just talking about that so we've had a couple interviews i love it when we chat because you always share yourself very generously and you always give good nuggets of wisdom so we're gonna like jump into this topic Let's jump right in. Are you ready? Let's go into the deep end. Hey, we're going into the deep end. So when I reached out to David about coming on and um, being interviewed, instantly he sent me content, which is amazing because most of my experts don't necessarily do that. <laughs> but it was this really great passage from this book, and I want to let you share it. Are you are you up for that? Are you? I am up for you that. Cool with that. Yeah. Okay. It was. I mean, it was very serendipitous or ironic or whatever you want to call it that I was actually on this passage when our whole interaction developed but I thought it was very timely perfect so it's from Jordan Peterson's 12 rules of life and this passage about Adam and Eve so God says who told you that you were naked did you eat something you weren't supposed to Mm. and Adam in his wretchedness points right at Eve his love, his partner, his soulmate, and snitches on her. And then he blames God. He says, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave it to me, Mm. and then I ate it. How pathetic and how accurate. The first woman made the first man self-conscious and resentful. (laughs) Then the first man blamed the woman, and then the first man blamed God. This is exactly how every spurned male feels to this day. First, he feels small in front of the potential object of his love after she denigrates his reproductive suitability. Mm. Then he curses God for making her so bitchy, (laughs) himself so useless. If he has any sense and being itself so deeply flawed. Mm. Then he turns to thoughts of revenge, how thoroughly contemptible and how utterly understandable. At least the woman had the serpent to blame, and it later turns out that the snake is Satan himself, Mm. unlikely as that seems. Thus, we can understand and sympathize with Eve's error. She was deceived by the best, but Adam, no one forced his words from his mouth. 
<laughs> that is a very interesting passage. Deep and powerful, I Deep would say. Deep and powerful, right? <laughs> yeah. So I wanted you to read it because I feel like it really defines like this idea of toxic masculinity and possibly even where it comes from. I mean, whether you subscribe to Christianity or subscribe to the original stories in the Bible, I mean, that description, I think, is pretty fitting for the dynamic that can happen when toxic ma masculinity is present, right? Yeah, for sure. So what do you think? I mean, as far as like laying down sort of a definition that we can all go by, because, you know, we all have our different thoughts about what different things are and we define things differently. But for the sake of this conversation, um, I mean, for me, what comes up is is how toxic, whether it's masculine or feminine energy, how toxic lack of ownership is. What comes up for you? When you say toxic lack of ownership, you mean ownership of... Of behavior, yeah. Behavior. Like, I feel like it's so important, um, the ownership of behavior. And I feel like when, when someone is in a toxic masculine state, that's what they're doing. They're not taking responsibility for anything. It's blame, 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 and shaming and meanness out of the, you know, not wanting to be wrong. Just, yeah. You know, wanting to be right and wanting to make everyone else wrong. Yeah, and I was, I was thinking about it myself, the toxic side of it, I think, is one, being aware of your impact on the other person. Yeah. But that equates to that, I guess, toxicity or the blame or not taking responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. Being true to yourself, but also understanding that you have an impact on your partner and on other people. Yeah. And if you're not aware of what that impact is and it's impacting them in a negative way, whatever negative means, yeah. then that could be considered, I guess, quote unquote, toxic. Toxic, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a hard, I guess it's a slippery slope because, you know, I guess if you're in, in a relationship with someone, whether it's familial or romantic or whatever, there has to be a certain level of, you know, all of us being willing to accept the feedback, right? And accept what people have to say about us. Yeah. And I think, you know, culturally and historically, there's this idea that, you know, and it's a very misogynistic idea that as the man, you know, you're the, you're the speaker, you're the one in charge, you're the boss, you know, and I don't necessarily disagree with this idea that, there, that the leadership roles kind of, you know, go back and forth. Like, I do think it's some, for some things in a healthy relationship, the man is the leader, for some things, the, the woman is the leader. In a healthy relationship that's non-romantic, I feel like the leadership role can change. Some are better at the emotional leading. Some are better at the logistical lead, you know, leading. But I think this idea that you can't be shared with or that someone can't give you feedback on who, how you're showing up or how you're being, I feel like can be a very toxic... I mean, granted, it's hard, though, because people can make each other wrong. You know what I mean? <laughs> For like sure. no one likes to be made wrong about <clears throat> yeah. who they are and how it's almost are. like an autopilot thing because we're defending what our feelings are and what our position is yeah but then it's hard to balance that out and i think as we're talking about it there's got to be a certain level of communication and awareness with your partner and some of the roles in different relationships may be different for different couples yeah so how do you communicate that define whatever those boundaries are what does one partner want what does the other partner want and can we come to some kind of understanding and agreement there versus a clash yeah you know somebody's stepping over somebody else's boundary and that can create a lot of discomfort i would say yeah yeah and i feel like also it can put people on the defensive so then you have a lot of masculine energy just like because you know, women we can we can express masculine energy too, but it's just like warrior energy. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. and there's no give. Yeah. Right. So I um, wanted to write a post about this because honestly, David, the reason that I even was inspired and look at all the people coming. So we have Anthony Kenya, Lee, hi my honey, and Angela. I love that you guys are here. So the reason I wanted to do this topic is because I recently, you know, had a, I want to call it a run in <laughs> with someone who I found myself to be very incompatible with. But it took a minute because I really was, you know, wanting to be in a space of openness and understanding and, you know, seeing where it could go and and not uh, quick to judge and quick to, you know, because I feel like that's something that we often do. We quickly judge and then we walk away or, you know, discard people. But I I had sort of like a. And I don't want this to sound from a victim place, but I had a, a very traumatic interaction with this person because I wasn't proud of who I was in the situation. And I don't like it when I let people bring me to a place I don't want to go to. But it, it 
helped me to see that there's something, not that I'm responsible for their behavior, but there's something that is still attracting that sort of thing, That's that sort of abusiveness or toxic masculinity. Yeah. So, of course, I had to write a post about it. Those who watch and those who know me that when I'm dealing with something, I write a post about it. Hi, go. Shani. So I wrote a post and I kind of want to collaborate with you. Because I don't want to just put it out there like another woman giving her opinions about men, another you know scorned woman who's like this dog. Scorched earth. Exactly, scorched <laughs> earth. <laughs> just casting aspersions and you know saying what she feels is so. So I'm I want to use this time to kind of like collaborate on the content that I came up with. That sounds like a great plan. Do you like that plan? I do. Oh, good. I love that you're games. This is why I love Rushy. Yeah. Candace yeah. reached out and I said, yeah, of course. I'm all in. I love that. It's good. <laughs> I'll and, try to be. And you were playing shuffleboard. Wait, well, let's take a moment on the shuffleboard because I think that that's really cool. Like, that's yeah. not... Usually when people say that they have, like, you know, their after work activities or whatever, shuffleboard is not usually the thing you hear. No, it's a rare <laughs> new occurrence. In downtown Brooklyn, you can go play shuffleboard. You can get in a league. Actually, as I was standing there and thinking about masculinity and different gender roles and all stuff like that, mm -hmm. I also play ice hockey. So if I yeah. crash ice hockey up against the shuffleboard world, it's kind of a different element to it. Totally. Uh, I came in one time, and I was we were playing a bunch of older men and women, and I was like, oh, we got this handled because of fitness and athletic competitiveness, and they crushed us all over the quote unquote shuffleboard court yeah, because yeah. they had better strategy, skill, and acumen. Yeah. It was interesting. It was eye opening. So I learned something on the shuffleboard court. A, don't think you're better than somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> and come in with that confidence and I mean it's important to be confident, but yeah. I was we were it was like, no problem. We're gonna wipe the court with them and that didn't happen. <laughs> Does it take let me ask you this, does shuffleboard take more of an analytical approach than ice hockey? Because when you say ice hockey, I I think of like just sheer force. Like you know what I mean? Like, do whatever you can to get that puck where you need to get it. Yeah. And then shuffleboard, to me, sounds like, you know, people thinking about what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's a combination, right? Yeah. Shuffleboard, you have time to plan out your strategy. Gotcha. I think what happens in the moment in hockey is if you just have instinct. So gotcha. a lot of it's going on instinct based on trained behavior. Yeah. Shuffleboard is, well, I have accuracy, but I also want to strategize about how I'm going to do this. Yeah. And I've got time to think about it. I love yeah. that you're doing that. Yeah. And when you get to re retirement age, you're going to be kicking ass. That's it. Because <laughs> you would have been doing it for like 30 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, I wrote this post. You guys know I love a list. And I, I don't know if you can see it, but I divided it into like toxic masculinity, healthy masculinity. And as always especially for the ladies out there, you know that when I do a listicle, I want us to always be cognizant that we're not... Um, identifying a person by by one or two actions and that we're not like you know everyone's a field of possibility but someone can show up consistently in a way that doesn't work and we just want to be able to recognize that when that's the case right also i don't think it's good to be looking for for the things like i feel like when it shows up you recognize it mm -hmm. right and you know that if I would, what's funny? Well, it's, it's funny because I, I often don't think about necessarily toxic and healthy masculinity. No. But as we broach this comment and I've shared with you, things have come into my world around this, this topic, whether it's conversations I've had with people or mm -hmm. the interaction I had at Vitamin Shop today. Tell them. Or the tell article the that. So I, I walked into Vitamin Shop today and I was checking out and the lady behind the counter she winced a little bit and so I said well what's wrong what happened and she said well I hurt my hand and she went into a little bit more detail mm -hmm. she had an interaction with her significant other mm. got a little frustrated got a little angry and ended up punching the door and this is the story she's telling me mm -hmm. at the counter and but it was just right there in front of me it's often what we put out into the universe sometimes does come back right. to us so Right in my face, there's an example of what I might call, I don't know if you call it toxic masculine or femininity, but it was a, a level of frustration that led to something violent. Yeah, yeah. That probably, sh her looking back, now she has a fractured hand. Yeah. Not necessarily the best way to, to deal with it, but something caused it to go to that level. Yeah. And I think that's part of what our conversation totally. is exploring. Absolutely. And then I'm scrolling through my news feed, and it talks about cuddle parties for men... <laughs> <laughs> masculine and, and dealing with toxic masculinity. It's a group in Pennsylvania that is now having cuddle parties so that men can explore their, I don't know, like sensitivity and everything yeah. else with other men. They their talked about 
They talked about sh- stroking uh, beards. Yeah, I did. I read because you sent me it, and I was very interested. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they talked about stroking beards and hair. <clears throat> Right? But then you asked me, would you be interested in that? I mean, I don't think that that's my cup of tea. Yeah, which I, you know, I'm not mad at you for that because I feel like, you know, and I don't. I here's the thing, because this is a this can be a very fine line, right? I love everybody. I don't think there's any right and wrong as far as what you desire and what can work for you. And I don't think you know your decision as far as your sexuality is what makes you. Not just your decision, but inherently how you're born is what makes your sexuality what your sexuality is, right? But I can understand why, especially in our culture, that your average straight man, even very enlightened, wouldn't feel completely comfortable with spooning and stroking the beard of another man. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't wake up and say, oh, that would be good for me. And I I don't know that necessarily the population of men, maybe it's just our the way we're developing or evolving would necessarily be open to it anyway. Could it have healing properties for the right guy? Potentially. Yeah. 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 It definitely I wouldn't be, be sharing it necessarily with, with my friends and saying, you should go do this and that'll heal your toxicity. Right? Like whatever's <laughs> going on with you. It might actually cause fights. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to get into this a little bit. Um, toxic masculinity, what, you know, things that I have seen and that have come up, you know, for me lately that I have sort of recognized. And then also what I think is the healthy alternative. Now, I don't want to come from a place of on high, like I was perfect because I can be a little toxic myself. You know what I mean? And I mean that in a very like taking responsibility kind of way. Like I, I, you know, I can mix it up. If somebody starts a fight with me, I won't start a fight. If someone starts a fight with me, I can't always guarantee you're going to see my highest self. You're going to put your gloves up. <laughs> I might. Yeah. I might. And it, but it depends. Like, I, you know, I'm not quick to do that. I, it takes a lot. It really takes a lot. But, you know, I, I have been known to, to let things go to a point where it's like tick, tick, boom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say on a side note, you're perfect just the way you are, no matter what you do or don't do. I agree. Thank you, David. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for actually putting words to it. <laughs> Thank you, honey. We all make our mistakes along right. the way, but I think we're all on our journey in that way, too. So right? I'm not necessarily saying it's okay. But yeah. 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 And I love that you said that, too, because I feel like so much of this toxicity is about the wrong making, like that you can't be all the different sides of yourself, right? And that we don't, we sometimes don't allow ourselves to be all the different sides of ourselves because we're so busy making it wrong, yeah. right? And then having to make other people wrong. So here's the first one that I came up with that I feel like is a toxic... Uh, sign. Some people might call it a red flag or whatever. And, you know, for all of these things, they can show up at any time with anyone, even if they're very healthy. But if you're seeing something like this regularly, easily offended or insulted and tends to over retaliate after determining that you're out to hurt him. I've known a couple guys who like when they feel like that you've pushed their button, they're ready to punch you in the face. Like, they got to get you back or they got to say something really, really nasty, even, you know, without any taking the time to even see if that's what you meant. Or And I'm someone who kind of like, I love comedy and I'll tease people and I say things not they're not ever mean or like ill intended. Yeah. But especially if I'm dating someone, I tend to, you know, maybe tease them a little bit, like jokingly make fun of them, but not in a like. You know, I'm not looking for your insecurities or anything like that, you know, but a couple of times I have definitely attracted where it's like, you know, I say one little thing and then it's like, I got to tear you down. So, you know, like get in your place, woman. Oh, so you're you're saying something and then they're coming back at you with, I need to tear you apart or break you down. Yeah. 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 Or like, yeah. Would there be an example of that or what would, (sighs) if we were digging Because Sorry I, to probe. I know, right? I do. I do tend to share. It's it's hard to share without you know because I don't want to out anybody. But um, you know, like you tease someone a little bit about. Uh, uh, okay, someone recently <laughs> they fancied themselves kind of a comedian, and they weren't, they weren't that funny. Like, and I lo- love comedy, and I'm willing to laugh at myself. Like, I'm the first one to laugh at myself. But you know, just just one of those types of people who just like thinks that they're very funny. And if you laugh a little bit, they'll just keep pushing with it, pushing with it. And so I kind of joked. I was like, you know, you're not as funny as you think you are. Like, and I know that could sound very hurtful, <laughs> but in return, it's like the response was just very, very victimized and hurt and sensitive. And then just kind of like, just a meanness came back. And I was just 
you know, and yeah. I don't know. I pushed a button, clearly. Yeah, you incited a riot. I incited you, a riot. You found a sharp nerve. You poked it. Exactly. And then you got the response. And I didn't know it was a sharp that. nerve. Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, if I felt like that, it, it would have been an insecurity. Like, you know, I didn't think that he fancied himself so seriously a comedian. <laughs> so yeah. I felt like, you know, but apparently it was. Yeah. Well, I think those sensitivities in relationships can be a fine line. Yeah. And sometimes we know them. And we get a little offended or we get a little pushed into a corner. So we're going to come out swinging a little bit mm. and we're going to hit their nerve. And this is something in communication when I'm doing some of the stuff that I do on the corporate level is if you come at me with some kind of objection or pushback and then I come back at you defending my position, now all we're in is a clash or a fight. Right? So can I understand your position before I actually throw something back at you. Mm. And I think that's something that in sales relationships, client relationships, and personal relationships is very can be very powerful. We, we don't always in the moment Let's exercise moment. <laughs> that kind of patience, pausing, and actually digesting. We just, we're ready to fight. We put up our gloves and then it's a battle. Yeah. 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 And I have to say, like, in as much as I consider myself to be sort of a, a strong woman and someone who can stand in communication, like, when I feel like someone, you know, has, has taken me in a way and has to retaliate, like, I, I, like, I'm quick with the defenses, which I think is, you know, most of us are, right? Like, if you feel like someone's coming for you. Then it becomes, like you said, that thing where it's like, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think part of that is our awareness. I know for me, sometimes in historically, that has been my thing. If somebody comes at me, I may not even go right back at them, but I'm going to have some passive, aggressive like poke about something down the road yeah. rather than having a constructive, open conversation about what the actual thing is. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more like, I got hurt, I need to hurt you versus something hurt me and I want to express myself and let you know that that bothered me Yeah. in a healthy way. I guess right. there's different ways to express it. And I was thinking about it earlier is I think some of us are not, and myself included, are not always armed with the skill set or the tools to express it properly. Yeah. So when it does come out, it comes out as that attack. Yeah. And that's all we know. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's how some of us just deal with things. Not, I mean, I'm not placing blame or not placing blame, but it is a certain awareness and a skill level of how do we communicate effectively with our partners. Like either you know or you don't know. <clears throat> if you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think there's, there's always, we always know if we really were to dissect it, mm. is that going to upset somebody? Yeah. Could it upset somebody? Yeah. Should we say that or should we do that thing? Yeah. And the, the answer is if we had time and really stepped back and took it from an objective view, probably. Mm -hmm. But in the moment and in the heat of relationship and the history of relationship, it's very difficult to have that outside perspective on our very personal inside relationship. Right. Like with emotions involved. Yeah. So what I put as sort of the, the healthy masculinity, because there is, you know, masculinity is a, is a wonderful thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> But uh, I think a healthy version would be can can laugh at himself because he's secure in his greatness and tease back playfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With everything that you said in play, like obviously, you know, to be at that point that you have to have a certain level of self-awareness. Yeah. And you have to be able to view yourself in a certain, exactly what you're saying, I think. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think playfulness is great. Sometimes it can cross boundaries and we don't know we're necessarily crossing boundaries. That's true. Because a, a joke can be a joke, but... If there is that underlying sensitivity, like you said, it may be something underneath that's incomplete for him, yeah. either with you or with his past. And so we're opening up that wound. That's something maybe to talk about. Yeah. But I don't think the, the fighting or the riot necessarily leads to the most never. successful outcome. Right? Yeah. Like never. It just makes it worse. So then another one is, is raging. And I put whether on the road, in frustrating situations, or wherever he can let out any neglected emotions. Like, I feel like that can be very toxic masculinity, where you're dealing with someone who, they rage. Like, if something doesn't go my way, or if, if you know, someone's, <clears throat> perfect example, walking down the street, they're looking at their phone, and they bump into me, and, and, you know, there's people who rage around that sort of thing. I think that's a toxic version of masculinity. Would you agree? Yeah, well, yeah, I've, I've seen that too. Ready to go to I, war. I think it's almost 
it wasn't anything personal, mm -hmm. but something happened to you, so now you're, you think you need to react in a certain way. I don't know where the line is for toxicity on that, but mm. I think it's if I'm doing something to somebody else that ultimately is going to impact their well-being, either physically or emotionally, yeah. then I want to be responsible for my actions. I don't think it's, I don't need to stand up for myself if it's a confront, but there's different ways of standing up for yourself. Right. And I think the toxic nature is when I'm trying to harm somebody else versus maybe handle it in a more healthy awareness communicative way right rather than like trying to make somebody pay yeah yeah <clears throat> i put has a default setting of peaceful strength and is moved by causing big solutions no time for pettiness do you think that sounds so lofty like i'm trying to like create some perfect man do you think i'm like because <laughs> now that i read it after you say what you say it's that you're what you're saying sounds so workable and you know it, it has like a, a rationality to it and now i'm like okay these things i wrote about healthy masculinity am i Am I trying to invent some perfect? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's an ideal out there for, for both sides, right? We both yeah. want some kind of ideal relationship where it is a harmony, but relationships aren't easy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the ultimate thing. But then do we tip on the side of this is not healthy for anybody? This is compromising boundaries. This is causing pain, unnecessary pain yeah. for the other person. If it's a reasonable conversation I just say this bothers me about you and I'm speaking from my own experience with the that I'm not trying to offend you it's more I'm just trying to express myself I think that's a different perspective than I'm coming at you with some hurting intent yeah whether conscious or unconscious there are mean words that are being said mean actions that are being said that do nothing to forward the relationship and if anything they're hurting the relationship yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know. There, there's the ideal out there, I guess. Right. But that's also a challenging thing because it's not always reality. But how can we all together evolve to have a more healthy conversation right. around our individual relationship and in general? I mean, that's a great question because I feel yeah. like, too, you know, we meet people, especially when you're sort of in the dating realm. And you guys online, feel free. Even though we're having a conversation, you know you can always chime in. Lee, I know you have some things to say about this because we've had a similar conversation before. And Angela, I know you have some things to say in Kenya. Um, you know, it's like when you're when you're in the whole dating realm and you start to get to know someone, it's like you don't want to be in a space of of trying to change or alter them right it's like if you don't like who they are then you don't really like them right in the first place but it's hard not to um it's hard not to like like you know want to to be able to find at least some sort of peaceful connection even if it doesn't mean a, you're attached to a long-term relationship do you know what i mean like the idea of just you know in, we're incompatible so that we have to like you know, it has to be a negative completion rather than, you know, we're incompatible, but we can still be peacefully friends or whatever. Like, I feel like that's a very difficult challenge. And that's also another reason why this whole thing of toxic masculinity came up for me, because I feel like, and maybe toxic fem femininity is, is the thing too. It's, it's like it gets in the way of just being able to be peaceful about your dating life. Yeah. You know, every time we, we feel like there's that discord or it's not working or it's incompatible, you know, the, the idea that so many people are, are quick to go to a place of now I'm mad at you and it's got to be negative or I've got to hurt your feelings. Yeah. You know, but then what do we do about that when we don't want to be in that space? It's you know? challenging because I think we all have our own personal journeys. We've all had our own pasts yeah. that often dictate how we act in certain situations, whether it's what we call healthy or toxic, yeah. we've just learned it. And some of us from childhood have our auto response mechanisms that just became habit for us. And so is there an evolution of, all right, this isn't a healthy way of interacting in a relationship and do I want to work to change that yeah. or am I just going to keep going? Should full, I full work to ahead? change that? That's yeah. the hard part. Because you don't want to be working to change people, I don't think. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying from a personal perspective, oh, I see. You know, are you on your you're journey? Working of, to change yourself, you're yeah. saying. I got yeah. you. Yeah. I got but you. we can't change other people. We can, we can say what we will and will not tolerate inside of 
a relationship or a circumstance. So if we draw that boundary and it continues to get pressed beyond, yeah. is that something we're going to stand for? Or is it something that at some point we have to say, this doesn't work for me anymore? Yeah. I have one that I feel like is like a deal breaker. And I feel like I, I would advise that it should be a deal breaker for anyone. And I'll tell you what it is. When someone's unforgiving, like they have to make you wrong. I feel like that's a very toxic thing. What would be an example of that? Well, like, and I don't want to keep using the same person. <laughs> I think there's some but, unresolved stuff. Right, there's some unresolved. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. But like, you, you know, you make a mistake or you say something that person doesn't like. And actually, I could go back a couple of relationships. And I can remember being with this person for four years and they would still bring up something that happened four years before. And even though I, you know, in my mind, cleaned it up, took responsibility for it, made amends about it, every possible avenue, you know, there's all the different, you know, restored the integrity, made the amends, AA, you know, like every possible thing I could think of, you know, including apologizing, which I actually think apologizing is lame, but you know, whatever, like I'll do whatever you want me to do to understand that it, my intention was not to hurt you. But then that's the thing that comes up every time there's an argument because it's never forgiven. Yeah. Like, I feel like that is a very toxic way of being in a relationship, like a refusal to forgive and a need to, like, continue to shame when you feel like that person has wronged you. Yeah. Well, I'm understandable for sure. Yeah. I think on the other side of that is, was it fully resolved when you did ask for forgiveness? Yeah. It sounds like it probably wasn't so that's why it keeps coming up for your partner and how do i think that's a huge challenge there's something happened in the relationship but how do we actually make it whole and complete or how do we make it so that whoever felt like they were wronged is now okay with whatever happened and yeah. oftentimes that stuff does linger yeah and we may not even want to admit that it does but then it comes out at some point where it's clear that that piece of pain is still underneath it all right like um, bubbling and that's a challenge because i think it's it's a challenge in general for us as human beings to resolve a lot of our past hurt yeah and maybe that past hurt isn't even necessarily from the thing you did yeah it's from that past relationship that that thing triggered the memory of i don't trust this person so i don't feel comfortable or you wronged me so i still have to wrong you because that's how i live my life yeah so much stuff can be just underneath the surface there i would say i would even go as far as to say even when someone has cheated on you because a lot of people feel like cheating is is the unforgivable thing but i think that every i i, I can't think of anything that is unforgivable i mean i'm sure there's you know we're not talking about crime and murder and things like that but you know as far as your interactions in a relationship but i think you're absolutely right it's like unforgivability is based on a historical uh hurt right like yeah. an unhealed historical hurt mm. i think i think there's everybody's got their own levels of boundaries or limitations or whatever that is it can be a hard fast rule for some people yeah if you cheat on me this is what's going to happen i will not be with like you deal breaker other people may have some flexibility there I, it's for everybody's choice to decide how they want to be but i still think if if you decide it's a deal breaker and walk away you can walk away with forgiveness because i think if someone cheats on you granted you know it can feel very hurtful it can feel very personal but a cheater what a cheater does is never personal right it's all about them and their own needs and their own you know stuff they need to work out right and that's not to say you know what people have to do i'm not trying to discount anyone's hurt feelings around that but you know i feel like forgiveness is so important just even if you're not in a relationship, <laughs> you know, yeah, and well, even I, if you're going to break up. Absolutely. Mm. I think we can always, if we choose to, forgive, and that gives us a little bit of a sense of completeness, yeah. healing, totally. release, but not everybody wants to forgive, and that's yeah. that's also their choice, too. Yeah. So, um, they want to hold on to it, and long term, I don't think it's good to hold on to whatever you can, but we actually, I mean, it's great if we could say, oh, I'm to that's totally behind me, but I know a lot of things in my life are not always totally behind me as much as I want them to be. Would you call that toxic, though? Because I feel the same way. I feel like the, it, or you think that's too judgy. 
in terms of what? <laughs> what the not wanting to forgive, yeah. like like those things that we hold on to that we don't want to forgive. Do you think that on some level that's what causes? are toxic behaviors and that it is actually toxic to not forgive. I mean, I agree with you. Like we all have our choice, right? You can choose not to forgive someone and carry the resentment until you don't want to carry it anymore. Right. Yeah. But I mean, could we classify that as toxic? I'd say there's probably different levels and I don't know how we bucket an official (laughs) toxic definition versus a healthy definition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get in trouble when you try to put it into the different boxes because there are different levels and everybody's got their own definition of what that may be for them. And so can we look at it, understand what the other person's understanding of that is? But Mm -hmm. I think it's healthy always to resolve past pain, past whatever it is. At a, if you really want to get from a health perspective, if you cleansed all toxicity out of your, your life, you would stop drinking, you would stop this, you would stop that. But every, that's not everybody's plan. Yeah. So there's different levels of where that comes into place. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually stopped dating someone about a year ago because I felt like, um, and I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I do. But as far as like the workability of a relationship with him, because he had a lot of resentment with his mother that was still very raw, like very raw, not even a, um, you know, I'm, uh, this is something that I'm working on. It was like, I've cut her off. She's a bitch. He had all kinds of nasty words for her. And I wasn't judging that he felt that way, but I just felt like a relationship with someone who's at that place wouldn't be workable. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah. it sounds like that he's harboring a lot of whatever he's harboring. Yeah. I would never say it's right or wrong. It's just his own personal thing that he's dealing with. But, yeah, it's likely going to impact relationships across across his spectrum of whatever's there. Because usually how we do one thing is how we may do some other things. Yeah, absolutely. And, too, it's good to know that you can, like, we don't have to make people wrong if it's not workable. You know, if we need to walk away, if it feels like, you know, whatever. I mean, we keep going back to this toxic thing just because I've written this post. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, I think you're right, David. Like, it doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule that that's what it is. But I do think it's okay, just as much as it's okay to be allowing and accepting of someone else's uh, journey, also knowing where you are and, and being able to walk away from it, right, if it doesn't work. Although, I'm also a big advocate of, you know, how do we make it work together, yeah, you know, and that's a fine. That can be a fine line it can too. Be such a sometimes you and I've done this to myself. Do I question my own um, background and who I am? Should I be a little more flexible in dealing with some of the things that come up in a relationship and compromising? Yeah, but I ultimately don't want to compromise myself. I want to be fully expressed, but do it in a quote unquote healthy way yeah yeah and not have that be something because if I know if I'm compromising myself and not expressing it now I'm harboring something and it'll probably come out at a later time Mm -hmm. and that isn't always the greatest thing right I think as much as we can communicate what's there in the moment or at least sometime soon so that it can get out and our partner knows where we're at is all better for everybody yeah I agree I totally agree this hour goes by so fast we're already at 44 uh-oh. It's going really fast and we haven't Okay, what about this one? When someone's mistrustful and doesn't offer the benefit of the doubt. Like I I also feel like because of the state of dating and relationships, especially as we get older and we're dating when we're single, like, you know, we get hurt a lot, right? So a lot of mistrust can build up. And, you know, like I said earlier, I personally believe that everyone is a field of possibility, like anybody can show up as anything if you just, you know, allow it. But I also think that it's very ordinary and common for people to be mistrustful and not be willing to give the benefit of the doubt and always sort of at the ready for the hurtful thing. And I feel like there's a toxicity to that. Are you going to tell me <laughs> not to judge it as toxic? Are you prejudging my response? <laughs> I've set a tone and now <laughs> <laughs> you're a field of possibilities, David. What there do you think go. about that? Like with the mistrust thing, uh, trust is hard because some people will say, well, trust is earned. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you say trust should be given. I think there's different sides of that coin as well. Mm-hmm. But can we have a conversation about what trust is? And if there is distrust, can we flush it out 
and actually deal with it rather than it being this thing that's underneath the surface that's continually impacting. I might see you doing something, maybe you're talking to some other guy, and for me that is a sign that is sensitive to me. And so are we talking about that? Or is it just something that's unsaid but now I'm holding it against you? I think in a toxic, healthy way, it's better to express it, have the conversation, see if we can come to some kind of common terms on it rather than it be this thing that I'm going to hold against you until it's the right time. Yeah. And now and use it. I'm already creating a, a blockage between us, whether you call it trust or not. Yeah. There's a distrust for me because I'm offended. Yeah. And I just want to, oh, I want to make sure we scroll because we got people. Let's see. We got Melissa Bush. She says, hi, Candace and David. I think once a scoreboard is put up, it's hard to take down. When you find someone who takes the time to actually listen, the male or female, you can make a huge difference. Listening and processing are way different than reacting. Yes, I think she was going along with what you were saying earlier. And I love that you 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 bring up the communication thing and the you know being willing to talk to your partner about like what's going on and stuff like that. Um, I had a point around that though, but I because I feel like it, it's it has to be understood that we none of us likes to be made wrong. So I think when someone comes from a mistrustful place. Or if they're suspecting you because of some action or they think that you're up to something or they even like don't trust your communication, I feel like what can often come back is wrong making. And I feel like wrong making is sort of like the the poison, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because in as much as it you know, I, I totally agree with you, it's so important to be able to communicate this idea that we have to, you know, somehow hold the other person's feet to the fire and react in an angry way every time they do something we don't like. I think that's toxic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds it. Right? <laughs> I'll give you I the mean, affirmative on that. You will yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely toxicity to that. What else did Melissa say? She says, I know I'm drawn to people that push me to improve. I also think when we don't meet those goals and expectations, we tend to blame our significant other for what started out as support and effort. We can quickly forget that really, they really just wanted to push you in a good way, not to put you down or make you feel guilty, bad, or angry. I think that's true, Melissa. I think that's going back to what we were talking about earlier. Kenya says, I find myself in that place a lot. Yeah. Oh, and my genie joined too. Kenya and I, all, all, you know, we talk about this often. I think what Kenya's talking about is, um, you know, the being with mistrustful people. Like some of the things that we've talked about is like, you know, when you're dating someone and, you know, obviously from a female point of view, you know, I know that men can get together and talk about all the toxic ways that women can show up too. But, you know, as women, we're talking about all the toxic ways that men show up, right? And some of the things that they say and do that that are, uh, that make a relationship unworkable. And Kia and I, we talk about this a lot, how, um, you know, things like mistrust, things that like, you know, I have to be right and I'll argue you down. Like, yeah. Like, to me, that stuff is very toxic. What do you think? <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, as I'm processing this in this conversation, I think there's a, a lot of stuff that doesn't necessarily push a relationship in the right direction. Yeah. And those things, whether we label them toxic or not, or whether are, are they driving us to the relationship we want, mm-hmm. or are they driving us away from a Ooh, real connection and a real communication? I think that's really, for me, a lot of the challenges being able to express myself effectively without having to impact the other person in a negative way. And if I'm coming from a mean-spirited background or coming from a mean-spirited communication, then that helps no one. Yeah. But oftentimes, sometimes people's default is that. Yeah, yeah. And so we're responsible ourselves. We're also responsible for are we going to put up with that when it keeps coming our way yeah. or are we going to draw some line in the sand and say, this, this doesn't work for me. If you're going to continue to do that, it may not work out for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think also what you're pointing to is like, you know, I talk a lot about like, what are we committed to? Right? Like I feel like when we're, when we're committed to having a good situation and intentional about that, we're less apt to show up in those sort of ugly ways, right? But, you know, and then what happens? It's like, how do people veer off? The the assumption is always that if we're dating, we're committed to getting along, we're committed to having fun, but a lot of people aren't committed to that. (laughs) You know, a lot of people are committed to fighting or, you know, uh, 
I guess, being guarded or holding themselves back. That's, you know, yeah. oftentimes what we'll run into. Yeah. I think I'm, I may have spoken in idealized terms, too. It's like yeah. this would be the ideal world, but oftentimes relationships are messy. Relationships yeah. are challenging, and people are going to do things that we may not always agree with, but can we, as a partnership, as a relationship, deal with them in an effective and healthy way yeah. versus it becoming this continual fight or pattern of, whether you call it toxicity or something else, but it's it's just not something that's healthy and growing the relationship. It's actually something that's causing a divide long-term and breaking us further apart. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And that's probably the key, too, is, like, the fact that, that you can discuss it and, you know, come to some sort of consensus about it, right? Yeah. Like... I would I would think that's the key to some level of sustainability. Yeah, I think I mean communication is at, at the at the it core. Can back. we communicate effectively? <laughs> right? Can we really? And we go to our some of our defaults, and those aren't necessarily the most effective. It's just what how we do things and how we've always done. Things. Yeah. Oh, I love that you brought that up. <clears throat> that how we do things and how we've always done things. I feel too like that is definitely something you know for me in my own growth journey. It's like I know there's certain defaults that I have, right? Right? But I didn't always know that. It just I just did what I did. And I feel like such a good indicator, like when something just doesn't work over and over again, it's such a good indicator. And this is only something I've learned recently, that I'm just defaulting to what I've always known to do rather than trying to make a new choice or just making a new choice. Yeah. 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 Which can be very difficult. But I feel like, like what you just hit on is exactly it. Too, yep. because so often we fall back on what it is we're used to doing. I mean, I definitely still do it, but at least you know I've got to a point where I'm like aware that's that's what I'm doing, and I'm like, oh fuck, you know, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, or or at least you know able to make a new choice. Yeah, and I mean, for me personally, sometimes I'm in a relationship, and I know in historic relationships, if I'm pressed for how do you feel mm-hmm. or what do you want. Sometimes it's like deer in headlights for me where I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, this is a tense moment. i got to be careful what I say for whatever reason that's inherent in me. So I'll say, I don't know, and I'll I'll clam up. So my challenge and my growth of of late is can I address that in an effective way? Maybe it's just saying, you know, I'm a little bit confronted right now. Can you give me some time to process this and Mm -hmm. actually communicate what's really there for me? Because... What's showing up is I don't know, and I know that's not the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but that even that for me taking that step in that moment is different than shutting the other person out and saying mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about this. It's I do want to talk about this. I just know that right now I need to process some stuff before I, I can actually it. have a you know show you tell you what I really think and really feel. That's, I, I love that you said that too because I'm going to say something that's going to sound like such a generalization. But I, I often advise uh, my female clients, it's like, you know, I think for women, generally speaking, we're walking around processing, analyzing all the time. And so when we're ready to talk, we're ready to talk. And I think with men, like, not that it's a, a better or worse thing. I think men just tend to be a little more pragmatic and simpler about the way they navigate life, right? Not that no. you don't sometimes overthink or that you don't overanalyze. But I think when you come to a man and you're like, you have this deep conversation that you want to have, a lot of times they're like, oh, shit. Like, wait, I wasn't thinking about deep conversations. Yep. So I think that's a huge thing and you know that you might be offering to men out there. Like, the willingness to just speak up for yourself and say... I'm not where you're at just yet, <laughs> and I can't, you know, like, without the wrong making, and I can't necessarily have that conversation right now because I haven't really given it its due. Yeah. I think that's a hugely <laughs> healthy, mature thing for a man to be able to do. And ladies out there, I think it's a, it's a very mature thing to be able to accept that yeah. and not insist. Like, we have to talk about it because I'm ready to talk about it. I mean, I've been known to do that where it's like, but I'm ready. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. And I've already thought it all out. So, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, in my own evolution, I have know this tendency, know the awareness of it. So I'll, I even in my one of my recent relationships preface some of my tendencies ahead of time. I said, you know, I'm really committed to being authentic and communicative. And I know sometimes I get challenged with that. So I want you to be aware of that. And I'm really looking to not have that be something that comes between us. Yeah, so it's yeah. almost like I laid it out there as a ground level beforehand. And something I also experienced recently in a relationship was 
her being receptive to it and also making it easier for me to express myself knowing sometimes that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And so if you can create that kind of relationship, it's a lot easier than I don't express myself, you get mad, and now we're in a fight. Yeah. There's a different dynamic there. Totally. Oh, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I know from experience. <laughs> it's a very different dynamic. So we're almost out of time because it, it just goes so fast. I, I still want to do, oh, I do want to say this thing about the sexuality thing. I feel like toxic masculinity can sometimes be sexually dysfunctional. And by sexually dysfunctional, I mean um, like either not understanding consent you know, we're going into the rapey realm mm -hmm. or um, some sort of fear of intimacy. So it's like, you know, there's something dysfunctional going on. And I think a healthy version is like it, that it's very healthy that men have a sexual appetite and that's okay. And, you know, just the understanding of not impeding on someone who's unwilling or unable to consent. I think that's reasonable. Right. I wanted to make sure to get that one out there because <laughs> okay. I do feel at least with that one there, you know, that one's kind of clear cut and yeah. pretty... Yeah. I'm not going to disagree with you. Right? Yeah. And I also think that men too often, because especially our culture right now, there's a lot of rape culture. I think men get shamed for their sexuality a lot. And I don't think that that's a positive thing. And so I feel like that's part of what can can turn it toxic. Not that it's the responsibility of, of women. It is the responsibility of men to find their health in that. But I do think it's important not to shame masculine sexuality. Yeah. I, yeah. I think sometimes that comes across as that may be present in communication or society or whatever it is, that there is a, you should not act that way. Yeah. There's you obviously right and wrong and lines you shouldn't cross, but inside of that, um, having a man's masculinity able to flourish versus be constrained, as long as it's within a healthy boundary. Yeah. 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 Healthy masculinity. Yay. <laughs> So I want to quickly do the vulnerability quiz. Don't uh -oh. look at the questions. Here we go. We're going to take like a minute because I want the people in, you know, the armed radio world to be able to to get the whole thing. And I want to be able to sign off for them. We're only going to do it for a minute. Or what we could do, I don't know how the armed radio people feel, but if you're out there listening, you can come and watch the video. We could do one more of the toxic, healthy things and then do the three-minute quiz for the Facebook people yeah. or for the social media people. What do you think about that? You're in charge. <laughs> See, I love it. That's healthy masculinity. You're in charge. I'm handing over the that. power. Right? Not afraid to be next to a strong woman. Anyway, so here's another one. The denial of, of feminine energy. Because I feel like as men and women, we both have masculine and feminine, right? But I think there are some men who are so shut down of their fem feminine side that they pretend they have no emotions and they sort of like guard and block it with, you know, sports, conversation, whatever. Like they do anything they can. Oh, that means we have one minute with armed radio. They do anything they can. What do you think about that? Make it shorter. Huh? Make it shorter? All right, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Armed Radio people, you're about to go. Facebook people, we have a few more minutes with you. Um, thank you, Armed Radio people, for being here. I love you so much. Until next time, never forget you're a love machine. If you ever start to feel like you're not getting enough, just make more and then ask for candy. I love you for being here. Don't forget to join Armed Radio Group News and the Creative Love Collective. And I'll see you guys next Monday. You guys on the Facebook, 